Hi, friends. Today, my guest is Robin Dreek, and he is the ex-head of the FBI's Behavioral Science Division. Now, that sounds like an incredibly secretive and exciting job to have, and it really is. Today's discussion takes us through Robin's 21-year in-field career, including when he was in Manhattan on 9-11. He was out for coffee with his friend as the first plane struck the North Tower and then back on the 25th floor of his department when the second plane hit. Apart from that, we're also going to learn the verbal and non-verbal cues that both you can use to help encourage trust and make your communication with others more effective and also to be able to detect deception in other people. Robin really is the real deal. Uh, It's evident that he has a very terrifying and wide-ranging skill set of personal and interpersonal communication. Um, I'm super happy to have him on. Uh, I'm not going to pontificate anymore. Please welcome Robin Dreek. Oh, yeah. P.S. We did have some connection issues during this episode. Uh, I promise that any of the cuts I made weren't due to Robin giving away national secrets and also the irony of a podcast about communication being beset with communication problems is not lost. But there may be a couple of jumps here and there, so just bear that in mind. So, Robin, is this the moment where the FBI burst in through the door of my bedroom and tell me that we need to stop this interview? Is that when this happens? No, because I duck and weave really well. (laughs) And you're on the other side of the screen, so you're going to be fine. Well, anyway, thank you very much for coming on. Welcome to Modern Wisdom. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. uh, Thanks for having me. I'm excited about it as well. It's going to be a great, great conversation. So can you tell the listeners at home what your job roles were, please? Sure. Uh, so I'll kind of give you a chronology um, from the beginning to the end without taking a million uh, million, million uh, minutes to do this yeah. uh, just because it's not boring. But it, it's good to frame the background of where I came from to where I arrived and where I'm still going to. And that is so uh, my background is I graduated from the United States Naval Academy here in Annapolis, Maryland. And from there, I went on to become a Marine Corps officer. And from there, I joined the FBI. And I joined the FBI in 1997 and worked counterintelligence for my entire career. So I was assigned to the New York field office in Manhattan. From there, I went to Norfolk, Virginia. From Norfolk, Virginia, I went into management. So I went up to the J. Edgar Hoover building here in Washington, D.C. Um, also, during my entire career, I worked Russians. So that's kind of the, the nouveau thing these days, although for 21 years, no one was listening to me. <laughs> um, and so uh, and so when I started running the behavioral now, you know, the the program at headquarters, during my time in New York, before I got there, I got on our behavioral analysis program for counterintelligence. And, and what the behavioral analysis program is, and a lot of people know about the profilers and the behavioral analysis units from things like Criminal Minds and movies like that. Those are the criminal guys, the guys that work on criminal cases. My team, we work nothing but counterintelligence cases. And my team's whole strategy all the time was how are we going to create a good, healthy engagement with another human being? Whether you're trying to recruit a spy, talk to someone, interview someone, whatever it is, is we're always strategizing engagements. And so from FBI headquarters, uh, I, I eventually escaped, thank God, because I'm not a I'm not a headquarters guy, I realized. And they asked me to go down to Quantico, where I taught um, counterintelligence interviewing and source recruiting and things like that. And then I took over our behavioral team as the head of it back in 2010-ish. And I ran it for three or four years until sequestration, which was a big budget thing we had, eliminated my team and a bunch of things. And so I went back down to the street and I worked <clears throat> as an agent on the street, working counterintelligence for the last couple of years before I retired. So yeah, my entire career has been nothing about um, trying to recruit spies, catching spies, talking to sources, all nothing but intel all the time. Right. I mean, that sounds like the stuff that um, novels are made of, right? It's a lot of kind of the typical spy stuff. That <laughs> sounds like the the proper James Bond shit. It is. It is. You know, it's pretty funny. And I actually, you know, you being in the UK is really great. I, I have a saying, uh, especially when I was in New York, I love love working with the Queen because uh, 
we we worked with MI5 and MI6 a lot. And uh, I love them a lot because their funding was always better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> and they're great hosts. Very, very great hosts. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, you know, I think the, the Brits are, are, are pretty well renowned for the fact we have good tea and... You know the weather's not so good, but everything else. That is... wasn't what we. That wasn't what we were drinking. <laughs> yeah, I bet it wasn't. Um, so you've mentioned there some, you know, New York field office in Manhattan and the J Edgar Hoover Building. Those are places that I really only know as references from movies. Um, sure. But th- that sounds like a sort of place where there's an awful lot going on. A pretty big hub of activity, I'm going to guess. Yeah, um, but you know, I always. You know, I'm always, I mean, just think about this. People are generally under impressed with their own jobs. It's, you know, because <laughs> Very true. it's always, it's always the outside optic. You know, for me, it was my job. Basically, my job was to build relationships and build trust. Yeah. I got you. And, and so what was interesting was, you know, a lot of people, so, you know, I wound up writing a bunch of articles and uh, wrote a couple books. I got another one coming out this week year. And my, my intro to whatever I'm doing, a speech, a talk, you know, podcast or, uh, even in my writing, it always starts out with me kind of laying out that background of mine, which says, wow, this guy is a type A hard charging guy. Okay. And I say, absolutely right. The problem is if you want to recruit spies, you're going to fail majestically with that, beha- with that kind of behavior profile. Wow. <laughs> okay. So take us, take us through what that means and why that's the case. Sure. Well, and, and this is how I relate uh, related to business with all the companies I work with, because I, I call my job the most challenging one uh, in sales because it was literally the toughest sales job I think anyone could have. And that's what I have always when I transition and I talk to a lot of groups outside the FBI. And obviously, that's all I talk to now. Um, this is how I line it out, because when I was in New York and my job is to recruit spies, here's what that meant. Um, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm selling a concept to someone from a foreign country. And the concept I'm selling is that helping the United States is really a good idea. <laughs> and even though it might not be in your best interest for your country, it's in the best interest of my country. So first of all, I'm selling a concept, an idea that helping and cooperating with me is a great idea. Um, so that's that's so that's my product. Um, the second most challenging thing now is it's actually illegal for me as FBI to walk up and talk to a foreign diplomat because all the spies are foreign diplomats under diplomatic cover. And by treaty, it's actually illegal for me to approach them. So if my client that I'm trying to sell this product to, one, doesn't really care for my product, two, uh, it's illegal for me to actually contact him about my product, um, th- that's your first challenge. There's a couple, and, of, and, couple of big barriers there. Yeah, it really are. And and the other thing, so if you can't talk to them directly, you're going to maybe try to sell through third parties, you know, some of their contacts. And, you know, in law enforcement, I, I love to say, you know, this this analogy, because most people that work in law enforcement, there's a reason why people have to talk to them. They've done something illegal. <laughs> so there's a compulsion. Well, when you work in the world of counterintelligence, very rarely have people done something illegal. You know, take spies, for instance, you know, it doesn't matter what country they're in. All they're doing is collecting intelligence and what generally is intelligence well it's actually reading things in the newspaper hearing things on the news or 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 looking at a blog or something like this and so you get in information and now your next job is is to source that information to people in the know so say they read something in a newspaper they read a blog they see a posting well now they're going to go to like the president of a clear to funds contractor another diplomat someone from a think tank that they can say what do you think about this now they get their opinion on it. Well, now that opinion has sourcing. Now sourcing becomes intelligence, and none of that's illegal. And so there's no compulsion for them to want to talk to me because they've done nothing illegal. It's illegal for me to talk to them. They don't want to buy my product, and now I want to talk to people that are around them, and the people around them that are talking to, they're not doing anything illegal either. Wow. And so – yeah, so what I quickly realized you know, when you're in your late 20s and you have this hardcore type A personality – is if you approach people with that kind of personality that don't have any reason why they should want to talk to you, you're going to get shut down really fast. <laughs> um, and so that was my background. So luckily for me, though, I was on a squad of people um, that were my Jedi masters. You know, one in particular, his name is John. You know, he had this art form down. And, and just to give you an example, you know, in my line of work or my previous line of work, getting, you know, actually recruiting a spy from another country to cooperate with us and give us all the jewels of the kingdom. It's, it's like hitting lotto. It's that rare and it's 
that beneficial when it does, mm-hmm. you know, or, or winning, you know, winning sweepstakes. Yeah. Um, and when you do, it's it's extremely beneficial. So I always viewed my job every day as like buying a lotto ticket. I create operations that give me an opportunity to, to hit lotto yep. or, or hit that sweepstakes. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, one of the guys on, on that I was working with that became my, my mentor guide and, and really my best friend, uh, he had hit lotto 14 times in his career. Oh my and, God. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. And, and it was really dumbfounded because I never knew that for years. Just because uh, one of the one of his great tenets of life is he lived with great humility and humbleness. Mm. He never made it about him. His desk at work had no "I love me" trophies or posters on it. Um, it was always about everyone else but himself, and that was really the key. You know, I started modeling my behavior. I tried to after him, and then when I started, when people started asking me to teach this, that was the first time I actually had to take my friend John's art form of interpersonal communication and make it a paint by number so it could be replicated. Yeah, and that's. And that's where all this started getting born. That's so fascinating. I mean, it, it very quickly goes away from being luck and goes on to skill when you win the lottery 14 times, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so well, there's you, no luck involved with this. Yeah, for sure. No, and, and, and it's so funny too. It, go ahead. Did you have a background no, in psychology or in um, uh, any sort of behavioral sciences before you went to the FBI? No, um, actually, you know, my background was leadership from the Marine Corps um, without realizing I was getting this art form better by the time I'd gotten out, um, came in the FBI. And actually, it was very helpful because I had all these – I probably had about 15, 15, 17 years of field experience doing this before I actually worked on my graduate work in organizational psychology. And so I started seeing the science behind why everything I was doing in the field was working. So instead of learning, so instead of having the education first and then trying to apply it in limited situations, I had, you know, over 21 years of experience of, of, of living this. And now I was learning the, what I call lanes behind these actions behind it. So it actually was more reinforcing and made a hell of a lot more sense to me afterwards. And so it was a combining of two matter of fact, when I would assemble a team to do a consultation for someone in the country, typically I put three, at least two or three case agents that had operational experience like I did. And I put them with, you know, and one of my organizational psychologists that actually could just validate the science is solid by what it is we're trying to do. Uh, So the uh, collaboration of brains and brawn kind of to a degree, I suppose. It's always, you know, and at the root of everything that we're always trying to do is, and someone once asked me too, you know, so how do you recruit a spy? I said, well, first of all, you don't. And it's like with any individual, and and this is sales as well. You know, while you're trying, all human beings are trying to do is they're trying to be affiliated and validated by people. And ultimately, human beings are exceptionally predictable. And here's how they're predictable I can always take at face value that everyone will always act in their own best interest. We're genetically coded for it, we're biologically coded for it. And now my job is to figure out what you think think your best interests are. And one way we do that is, and this is where we do all the time, is I have to figure out what your priorities are. Your needs, wants, dreams, aspirations, personal, professional, long-term, short-term. And now once I figure out what your priorities are and I have resources that will serve those priorities, we're going to align. And that's and that's where sales comes in. And that's where collaboration comes in. That's where relationships build. And so what you're doing is when, you know, whether you're talking to a new potential client or you're trying to to recruit a spy, all I'm trying to figure out is what are your priorities, what are your goals and objectives, and what resources do I have to get you to that point? Uh, so what, what do you want and what can I give you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, awesome. with, with, with full transparency, you know, the biggest thing too is, you know, I am I am 100% anti-manipulation or deception or pretexts or any of these things because people can pick up on manipulation or attempts of manipulation or coercion very rapidly. You know, it, it gives you that creepy feeling, you know, when you meet someone or, you know, bad sales guy trying to sell you something, you pick up on it immediately. And so the best thing you can do is don't have deception. I, I refuse to lie, cheat or deceive or use subterfuge in any way because it'll blow trust. And once trust is blown, just give up. <laughs> Amazing. So take us through the basics of the, a behavioral science as as you were applying it in the field if you would sure so my my five steps that i realized that i was doing and I, here's well here's where it came from um i was asked to do an article right before uh i got out and it was on you know 
what do you what the, what does counterintelligence do? What does your team do? And I, I'd never really thought about it before. Um, and I because again, when you live something, you just kind of do and act. And so I, I took that step back and I, I, I gave myself that optic of what am I actually doing in all these behavioral assessments? What I was actually doing in all these cases throughout my career, you know, whatever, whether it was a recruitment operation, an interview, a double agent operation, false flags, I mean, all the fun, hooky, spooky spy stuff. <laughs> and, what I, and what I quickly realized was all I was ever doing was strategizing trust because I was always trying to get – and hopefully have someone for move from point A to point B. Hopefully point B would be a place that, that we could collaborate. And on the, on the only way someone is going to move from A to B and collaborate with you is through trust. And so when I took that step back and realized, wow, and everything I'd ever done in my entire career, and then for the larger optic in my entire life, and it's what we do as human beings, we're always strategizing trust and relationships. And so I broke it down to five really simple steps. Uh, it's what I call the elusive obvious. You know, so as you said, so here's the, here's the process. It's really simple. First, what's your goal? What is it you're trying to achieve? Um, and then the second part of that, so so why should they want to? You know, why should they want to be interviewed by you? Why should they want to co- cooperate with you? You know, why should they want to do anything? And at first, you know, that's as, as surface as I got with it, thinking to myself, oh, it's a very short-term goal. But then I asked myself, well, why do I want to do that goal? Where am I trying to go with this? And ultimately, in my work, I was trying to protect national security. And ultimately, I I came out with what I call the ends goals and means goals. And interviewing someone or recruiting someone or selling a product, that's really a means to the end. Mm -hmm. And at the end goal, whether you're trying to sell a product, you're trying to honor the mission statement of the company. Me, I was trying to honor and protect the national security of my country. And what was really fascinating was so many people and things have input on, on those means goals. You know, there's a lot of relationships that go into is someone willing to cooperate and trust you. So what I started focusing was on the end goals first. So I reversed it. And the end goals for me are very, very simple and easy. My number one goal in every single engagement one is a healthy professional relationship. Because without a healthy professional relationship, everything else will fall apart. I, I, I have become so adamant about focusing on relationships above all else that um, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I preach it at every opportunity I get because you know the greatest analogy I always have, whether I have a group of 1,000 people or two people, I, I, I can always say I can guarantee you not one person is sitting in this room as successful as you are without a relationship with at least one, two, ten people mm-hmm. because – Nothing can happen from that. So I always focus on the relationships first. Second, under that, my next goal is open, honest communication and transparency because you cannot have a healthy relationship without that open, honest communication and transparency. And my third anchor, my third end goal I always focus on is I make myself an available resource for the prosperity of others with no expectation of reciprocity. And here's how that breaks down. Available resource for others. I once offered someone help and he thought it was condescending that I was offering help. He thought I thought I was better than he was. And so he took offense to it. So that's why I have available resources. And because human beings do not like being looked down upon, they want to be treated as equal. They want to have, be affiliated and valued. So I have, I offer resources for their, their prosperity. Prosperity is a very open term. Prosperity according to what they think prosperity is. And the, and the last part of this is no, no expectation of reciprocity. In other words, I am being willing to give my resources to you without an expectation of reciprocity. In other words, I'm not trying to do this to get something. Again, as soon as you do that, you start going into the realm of manipulation. Shields go up and trust goes out the window. Mm. So those so those are my th- three anchors, and that's step one. As long as I get set on those and I move forward, then we're great. So step two, this is easy. Discover their priorities, their needs, wants, dreams, and aspirations, short-term, long-term, personal, professional. How do they – prosperity and success from their point of view because if you don't talk in terms of their priorities you're wasting your voice because everyone will listen to you if you're talking in terms of what's important to them so step two is about them step three understand their context how do they see the world through their particular optic without judging it in other words what's their age their demographic their ethnicity their gender um socioeconomic status at you know all these things play into how people see world through their particular optic and to that's generally also where we find places of affiliation and that we can build upon um one of my favorite questions when dealing with uh, lots of folks internationally is you know would you mind sharing a favorite family holiday you had growing up and again you don't have to have the same favorite 
family holiday, but what you have is a favorite family holiday. Yeah. Everyone has something they remember from their childhood. And when you share those kinds of things, well, look, I had a childhood just like yours. We had something we enjoyed. We had a tradition. We had a meal. We have taste. We have flavors. We have music. All these things are where we build those affiliations and we build that tribe. Because ancient tribal man, you know, a tribe of 30, 40, 50, it was the first form of survival. If you were not part of a tribe, the likelihood of you passing on your genetic coding to others was slim to none. And so we're constantly seeking to be affiliated with meaningful people in our lives and be valued by them. So this is the process by which we're doing that. So that's the third step. Fourth step is actually this is where you got to make sure you're talking in terms of them. I want to suspend your ego. And that is, you know, you got to put your own thoughts and opinions aside. You got to talk in terms of them and theirs and never argue context. In other words, if they have a certain point of view that you don't agree with, um, what's it going to cost you to not argue it? Mm -hmm. Second, be non-judgmental, you know, because people, here's another guarantee in life. If you start judging them verbally or non-verbally, I guarantee you their shields are going up because you're basically saying, hey, you're not part of my tribe. And so people get defensive and they'll get shields up. Honoring reason and honoring reason is really where you want to make sure that everything you're saying and doing is congruent with what it is you're trying to achieve. Keep that thoughtful mind engaged. Don't get emotionally hijacked where you're going to let your emotions interrupt what's going on between your brain and your mouth. And so honoring reasons, I'm always asking myself is what I'm about to do or say going to help or hinder what is I'm trying to do. And ultimately, remember what I'm trying to do is create a healthy relationship. Um, fourth is validate others. You know, validation, this is just seeking to understand that a deep level is possible. It's not saying you necessarily agree with them, although agreeing with them can be validating, but just seek to understand, especially if you have a different political point of view um, on religion, gov anything it is. You know, it's not that you're seeking, it's not that you're placating them or pacifying them. No, you're seeking to understand how it is they have that certain point of view. The key here is you have to be congruent with, you know, what's in your heart. And what's coming out of your mouth? Because if your if your body language and your verbals are incongruent, you just look like you're you know you're full of it. Um, so you have to actually be honest in, internally about trying to understand them. And finally, uh, the fifth step of, of step four is be generous. Be generous with your time and be generous with your resources. And then finally, fifth step is craft this engagement. You know, how are you going to put all this together to have a great, meaningful, you know, genuine, sincere conversation and dialogue? And so to do that, the First thing I always do is I'm going to state a very specific um, validation of a strength, attribute, or action that I've witnessed. In other words, I'm going to always be seeking the greatness in others where their strengths are. So I can always start out with a conversation about, hey, when you did this last week, it had such a great result in this situation. Would you mind sharing with me how you came up with that? Would you be willing to share it with others? And from there, we just have a great dialogue and conversation. There's many other steps to that, but those are the five basic you know, steps I use, what I call the elusive obvious like how do you form a relationship of trust and uh health that's it i get it so it sounds like steps one through four are um setting the scene and coming up with what you're going to say and then five is delivery is that fair to yes. say absolutely okay. and, and it seems like i think like, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. based on what i thought about behavioral analysis i thought that it would be all step five that's probably my um, <clears throat> romanticizing a little bit of the of the spy industry and then a lack of understanding of just how much stuff probably goes on behind the scenes with counterintelligence and that the the tip of the spear is exactly just that it's the it's the tiny little bit at the end that delivers the the message or the blow or whatever it might be as opposed to all of the work that's gone be before it you know, you did a great job summarizing it and, and you couldn't be more right. I mean, it really comes down to you have to really know people and how do you know people? And, and this is this goes back to a lesson I learned really early on in my career uh, in the Marine Corps. I remember I got ranked last out of all these other officers <laughs> and a very humbling moment. And I, I go up to the, the guy that's trading me and I said, all right, what am I doing wrong? Because, well, you just need to make it about everyone else but yourself and and be a better leader. And I was like, well, I thought I was doing that. What the hell are you talking about? Make it about everyone but myself. How do you do that? What's what's the methodology? How do you make a conversation about everyone else but yourself? I didn't understand it. This process, this is exactly this. This is how you make it about the other person. You're, you're finding out their priorities. You're finding out their context. You're, and, and then how do you put all these things together to talk in terms of them? And you, know, you add these four things I'd love to throw into every statement I make is, one, I seek their thoughts and opinions. 
I talk in terms of their priorities. I validate them non-judgmentally, and I give them choices. When I do one of those four things and everything I say I write, that entire conversation is completely about them. I understand. And I'm going to guess that the science will say that that plays into a sense of trust and safety and focus on them as an individual, which I'll presume will probably lower barriers and stuff like that. Absolutely. So here's the science behind it. Um, we know this anecdotally because when you, you know, when, when you say, Hey, when someone's talking about things that are important to me, I love listening to it. Um, and we will have experienced those moments where we've had these conversations where you said you had to go in five minutes, but you're like, you're there for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes longer because you love the conversation. What's well, because they're validating you. So that's behind it. They, they did a, a great study at uh, Harvard back in the spring of 2012 where they actually wired people's brains up. And what they found was, on average, people spend about 40% of their day sharing their own thoughts, opinions, and ideas that they have. And what they're doing is they're testing the environment around them, saying, hey, here's what I think, and here's what I think, here's what I think, here's what I think, because we're seeking constantly to see if we can affiliate with tribes and affiliate with people. And what they found is when people were sharing their thoughts and opinions and ideas, and those thoughts and opinions and ideas are being validated by others, dopamine was being released in the brain so the pleasure centers you know were firing serotonin oxytocin the bloodstream our pleasure centers are constantly firing when we're being accepted non-judgmentally for those thoughts opinions and ideas that we have because we want to be affiliated with meaningful groups and organizations for survival so that's the science behind why when you structure a conversation dialogue and relationship like this it's magic, and it's it's and it, the greatest thing too. It's totally genuine. There's no, you know, I'm I'm anti-verbal judo and how to win an argument. I I just there's no strategy on how to do that. It's just a, how do you get to understand a person and make it about them? Okay. Piece of cake. I get it. <laughs> I, I get it. So the the first four steps that are quite conceptual, I think, <clears throat> must require a lot of research about the person. But to me, just seem like spending time under tension like work out what it is that the person wants and how you can speak their language and give them choices and, and, and don't judge. But the fifth one, I imagine, requires a little bit more skillfulness. Um, well, here's how I put it together. Here's how I generally structure um, my, and this, again, I don't have my notes in front of me, going off the top of my head. What I generally do is, again, step one is I make, I, I make a very specific statement of validation of a strength, attribute, or action. Now, that's if I know what one of those strengths are. If I don't, I'm going to be talking to a stranger, do a phone call. The first thing I'm going to validate is their time because human beings do not have to give me their time. So I'm going to be extremely deferential and gracious for the time that they can give me. And offer, also willing to walk away if they don't want to engage me because in order to make this conversation about them, you have to be willing to accept their denials of your time. So I start out with that. Next, I'm going to seek their thoughts and opinions about their priorities. That's step two of my, how I strategize. Now, if I don't know what their priorities happen to be at this point, because again, I haven't had any research because I do lot. I, I mean, we do this in sales all the time. We do lots of cold calls. Yeah. But the, but if you don't know what their priorities are, here's a general priority of every single human being on this planet: safety, security, and prosperity for them themselves and their families, because that's survival. And so, public safety is one that I'll always go to for the things I was doing. But safety, security, and prosperity. I work with financial companies all the time that sell insurance. Well, safety, security, and prosperity for them and their families, that's a priority. So again, if I don't know what one specific of their priorities are yet, one that I can ask them about and see if, and, and seek their thoughts and opinions on is, is safety, security, and prosperity for you and your family an important thing to you? And so that's step two. Now, uh, step, um, the third way I do this uh, next is I'm going to validate those thoughts, opinions, ideas um, that they just shared with me and validation again if i don't understand exactly what they're saying i'll dive a little deeper so i can get a better understanding and now most of the time what we're trying to do is we're trying to inspire people to listen to our thoughts and opinions ideas in other words what we're trying to impart on them and i use that word inspire because that's really critical uh, something i realized a number of years ago is that there's a big difference between trying to convince someone of something want to listen um, because really, you really can't convince anyone of anything because that's about you imparting what you want them to listen to rather than rather, I think of how can I inspire them to want to listen to me? Because if I'm thinking of inspiring you to action, if I'm thinking of inspiring you to listen or do something in order to inspire you to do it, it's got to be completely about you and your idea. 
So how do I inspire you to listen to my idea? This is easy. I'm going to ask you your thoughts and opinions and ideas about my thoughts and opinions and ideas. <laughs> in other words, in, in other words, you know, it's, it's, say someone has a certain political point of view and I say, no, 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 I don't agree with that. Here's what I think. That's me trying to convince you of my point of view and you're not going to listen as opposed to I, I, they say the same thing. And I said, wow, I never heard it really quite put that way before. Help me understand. How did you come up with that? And they share the thoughts and opinions and ideas. And I say, wow. I appreciate that. I was curious. What do you think about this? And now I'm seeking their thoughts and opinions about my thoughts and opinions. Mm -hmm. Everyone always wants to plant seeds with people by you know, giving them thoughts. You don't plant seeds with people by telling them what you think. You plant seeds with people by asking them what they think. And so that's where, that's where this part of the process is. I ask them their thoughts and opinions about my ideas. Um, finally, well, not finally, next, I now am ask them, hey, I understand their priorities. I've talked in terms of my priorities. Now I offer them choices of overlapping priorities. You know, I heard you say this, this, and this, and I thought this and this and this. Do you think we might be able to work on maybe X, Y, and Z? And now you're empowering them a choice. And then finally, if appropriate, I empower them a choice about remaining in contact or of assistance. That's it. That's, that's, that's the fifth step. That's how I, that's how I line it out. And so when I'm talking to someone live, I do it that way. Or if I'm going written, I just make sure that at least every one of those things is in every single statement I make. And now you've got yourself a spy. Now you've caught a spy in there, <laughs> the, the giving up all of the state secrets and you've got the Wi-Fi password and everything. Only, only if it's in their best interest to do so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Fair point. So I wanted to ask about um, specific techniques that you guys use in the field when time is of the essence. So obviously uh, when we're talking about this kind of a situation, it's a, I'm going to guess there will be a word for it, like a long, a, a longer game um, where you have time to prep, but there must be time, you know, you were, you were in the service. I don't know what particular um, department you would have been in at 9 uh, 11, but you know, there's periods of time yeah. where you, you yeah, it's right in New York City during it. Yeah. Oh wow. So I mean, well, first off, can you tell us? Can you tell us about that? What what, what it was like in the Secret Service when, when when that was that was happening? Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. Matter of fact, uh, the, my next book starts out with my my being right there during it. So our office in Manhattan was about five blocks away from the World Trade Center. Oh my god. And, and uh, I heard I was on the street with a friend of mine grabbing a cup of coffee, and we heard the first plane hit the North Tower. And we looked up, and it looked so small compared to the size of the building. We thought it was a small plane that hit, and immediately my, my mind and thoughts were going to, "Boy, there's no fog in the air. There's the guy must have had a heart attack." And I, and I went up uh, my my floor where I worked in the building was on the 25th floor, and so I was up in you know in our office looking at the North Tower again, like five or six blocks away. The smoke kept getting larger and larger and spread out more and finally started seeing what you thought was debris, you know, coming down from the floors in the North tower. And it was actually people jumping because you started seeing legs and arms flailing on the way down. Oh, wow. And that's, and that's when the South tower was hit by the jet coming uh, from the South mm -hmm. and th that fireball coming through as I, as like, you're watching a, a, you know, a movie and you're right there. So yeah, we, cause again, I worked counterintelligence at the time. And back then we were all in the same division with the terrorism division and the entire office. We worked nothing but then terrorism from, you know, probably about, boy, it was from right from September straight through to December. I, th I think it wasn't until December of 2001 when we actually had our first day off. We were on uh, we were on shifts of 12 hours on, 12 hours off, uh, seven days a week for that entire time. And it, it was, it was, it was like, it was a war zone, you know, that kind of exhaustion. Yeah. Cause again, that's 12 hours time, 12 off. That didn't, that didn't count, count your commute time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was, it was exhausting, but what an experience. Matter of fact, the, the first night, you know, I, you know, on nine 11, I go down to get my car to go home and I had an engine from the plane that hit the South tower about 30 feet in front of me. Uh, cause I had flown that far North before it hit the ground. Shit. That is crazy. Yeah, it, uh, it was. And so our entire time then was talking to absolutely everyone. You know, uh, you just absolutely, you know, there's so, so many leads coming in and you just talk to everyone that might know something. Uh, I, I was in, I got involved in so many different interviews, so many different things during a time for time frame because every day was a different day. You never knew what you're going to be doing. I was out of the Fresh Kills landfill with a rake, raking for fingers and toes and body parts to try to give back to family members one day. And then another day I'm out at, John F. Kennedy Airport pulling someone off a, a British Airways flight that uh, was a name hit coming in from India that they thought was a terrorist. I mean, you had no idea what you're going to do every day. 
Oh wow, that is that's like a the equivalent, the Secret Service equivalent of being a dog's body, I suppose. That like you not only you, you washing the cutlery one day and then you delivering the drinks and then the serving the queen and then doing everything. Yeah, it was a jack of all trades for a while, no doubt. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, with regards to needing to uh, gain trust or uh, be effective rapidly. rapidly, yes. Um, so one caveat I'll put to it: anytime you put a time constraint on having to do something, and you're not having full disclosure of your time constraint, you will be manipulation. Um, and again, that's that's just the name of the game. You know, I, I think having a, a Awareness of what you're about to do um, will keep things good for you so you don't start rationalizing what the relationship is. Because if you start using manipulative tactics, you don't have a healthy relationship. You have a very short-term you know, manip- manipulation relationship. And mm-hmm. so I, I, it's healthy for me to do that. And th- now, and I also caveat 99.99% of my time, I never had to do that, thankfully. Um, but when doing so, yeah, you can. They're you know, using the same methodologies that I lined out. It, they're exactly the same. Human beings will, will do exactly the same thing. Um, now, when you're gaining information, there's, you know, and I, people ask me all the time about elicitation. How do you elicit information from people? Um, one, you can't do anything without some semblance of trust. And so you will have to develop some semblance of trust. Now, it's not going to be it's going to be one sided trust because they're going to be trusting you. And you, even though you're actually viewing them, not in the same view, of the, you know, not in the same relationship, but they're, the, the, the human beings have this incessant need to be correct and be correct. Um, I think one of the e- easiest uh, elicitation techniques there are that people use pretty frequently is what I call an intentional misstatement. Um, so what that is, say something that you aren't quite sure of, blurt it out loud, ask them, you know, make a statement, and they will correct you. <laughs> it's a guarantee, you know, um, whether you're trying to gain a date of birth of someone, you know, just say, hey, I'm pretty good at this. What are you, born in June? They go, no, July. Go, oh, the 15th, no, the 22nd. I mean, and so right there, I got their date of birth without even asking a question. I made a statement. <laughs> yeah, I can play that through in my mind as well. And my desire to correct you is like coming up as oh, well. Absolutely. So, you know, by doing that, you get a lot of people's, you know, priorities. You start understanding their intentions, you know, so whatever tidbits of intelligence you've been um, tasked with getting, you create a strategy about how you're going to ask make an intentional misstep and about that specific type of intelligence because most of the time when you are, are trying to gather information and whether you're trying to do you know gather corporate information you know for you know for takeovers or you know to outbid a client you know or whether you're trying to you know recruit, recruit information for spies you don't want anyone else to be alerted to the things that you're looking for because mm. the i said as i said it earlier if you ask a question i guarantee you they're going to think about that question forever it'll rattle around in their brain so the the trick is don't ask questions about the things that you care most about finding out about. Mm, yeah, it's planting a flag in the ground to identify what your priorities are, which is not not necessarily what you were after. You wanted theirs, right? Right. So, but I'll tell you, I my earlier years, I was more into understanding and exercising that, and what I came to find out was was I got better and better at getting that. The stronger the relationship and the trust was. So I will I go for the rapid as fast as possible trust with full transparency, which which gets that trust at that point. And then I just come right out and ask them what I want and I ask and tell them why I need it. And you'd be amazed at how much easier that is. <laughs> can you can you give us can you give us an example? So, I mean, I mean, just probably my last couple of years before I retired, you know, we came up and I won't give you exact details. Mm-hmm. Um but we came up with a situation where we identified uh, an emerging threat, you know, to public safety. And they said, we need to find a source in this area. And I didn't know anyone, but I went to some of m- some of my guys that, you know, are my sources of information. I said, Hey, we need someone in this area. They said, I don't know, but because I have healthy relationships with them and they have healthy relationships with others about two weeks later, one of my contacts brings me a potential guy, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't introduce me, but gives me his website, gives me an email address, and I was like, ah, this guy might be right up the, you know, right what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. And so what I did was I looked at his industry, I looked at you know his background, and I strategized my my, and I actually re- sent him an email. And in the email, I validated his time, 
like I said before, I sought his thoughts and opinions regarding this specific industry and the, and the threat it might have to public safety, but at the same time wanting to protect his industry from being shut down if something from public safety went wrong. In other words, I talked in terms of his priorities. I sought those thoughts and opinions, and I said, here's why it's important to public safety, you know, because we want to prevent X, Y, and Z. And I said, would you be willing to have a conversation about this? If not, please let me know, and I'll leave you completely alone. Well, he called me with about – I think 15 minutes. And I said, Hey, um, Mr. So-and-so, you know, if you wouldn't mind, and he goes, Oh, I'd love to help out because of what you said. It, it makes a lot of sense. I said, great. Would you mind if I signed you up as one of our sources and put you in the intelligence system? And so that people can benefit from your thoughts and ideas and we can might protect us people. And he goes, okay. And there you go. That's as easy as it is. It wasn't using any spy craft subterfuge. It was like, Hey, here's how you can be a source. And here's how you can help, you know, protect people. Again, what are, what are people's general priorities? Safety protection their, of themselves, their families, and their well-being. Uh, what I like about the approach that you're describing here is that it does come from a place of virtue. For the listeners who are regular, they'll know that we're big fans, and as far as I'm concerned, truth is a superpower. One of the main reasons that I like trying to tell the truth as much as I can, although I'm not always perfect at it, is that by telling the truth, you never have to remember what you said. This Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I went through under, uh, I went through undercover certification course, um, years ago and, and they said the same thing, you know, you have only so many lies you can tell, and then you got to keep, tra the more lies you tell about who you are, the more you got to keep track of. Um, because once they're out of the bucket, you can't bring them back again. And so I just got in the habit of not lying and it was so much easier. I, I just don't lie. Now, if I can't share something with you, there's a big difference between lying and not sharing something. And if I can't share something with you that you want to know, I apologize and tell you why I can't share. Because again, I have transparency. Yeah, there's a difference between, as Sam Harris describes it in his book, Lying, he says there's a difference between lies of omission and lies of commission. And I think that's, yeah. uh, that's identified quite nicely there. So we've talked about being on broadcast. What about when you're on receive? Are there some strategies that people can use to identify... Um, people that are untrustworthy or people that have an alternative agenda. And, you know, you, you watch these story, uh, the, these um, programs like Lie to Me and stuff like that, where you've got these inc right. incredibly proficient guys. For anyone who hasn't seen it, the, the main protagonist is able to detect a, a, a modicum of disgust at his stepmother's death. Because, and that means that he did it because his eyes flicked up and to the left and all of this kind of crazy stuff. I'm going to guess that the level of fidelity is not quite that high, but that there must be some some sort of uh, guys in the service who do have some pretty crazy skills like that. So I, I'm very good friends with a few of them. One of my best friends is Joe Navarro, uh, world-renowned body language expert, and he will be the first to, to tell you as well. You, The best people in the world, including jo Joe, can only detect deception 50% of the time, 50% accuracy, using nonverbal detection alone because it simply doesn't work. Because what you do is if you're going to use nonverbals, and I do, I, and what you're looking for is you're not looking for deceptive indicators. You're looking for stress indicators because lying is stressful, but also remembering negative thoughts and uh, and events can be stressful as all. And so our nonverbals will indicate comfort from stress. And so I'm looking for, am I causing comfort? Am I causing stress? Um, but again, that's a whole separate topic to get into. But when, so basically, as I heard you ask the question, I get this asked a lot too. How do I, how do I make sure I'm not being taken advantage of or, or I'm not being manipulated or attempt to be manipulated, correct? Yes. This, is, this one is really easy because I get this a lot. So I, I, someone will say to me, so Robin, what do you do if someone's trying to manipulate you? And my first response when someone asked me that the first time, it kind of befuddled me because I said to myself, wow, it's never happened. And they said, well, how does it never happen? I said, well, this is easy because if I'm always looking for a healthy relationship and healthy relationships are based on open, honest communication, transparency. If you are actually communicating something to me that I don't understand because there's omission or there's blank spaces and I ask you a question for clarification, transparency, and you don't give it, I just stop engaging you because you're obviously not looking for a healthy relationship and it's okay with me. Again, I don't hold resentment against it. I just understand that, all right, you, your agenda is different than mine. And if I'm looking for transparency, you're not willing to give it, then I'm not willing to keep engaging with you. And so my, my only advice to people is, don't be afraid to ask clarifying questions. If you don't understand something, if people are talking fast or, or they're using words and terms or situations you don't quite understand, ask for clarification. Apologize, you know, self-deprecating humor, and ask for that clarification. If they can't give it to you, 
yeah, I'm, I become skeptical of, of the, the priorities that they have, you know, the goals that they have. I don't think they're going to be really congruent with what came out of their mouth, uh, especially if someone gives you the, that creepy car salesman, you know, feeling. It's because they're, they're incongruent with the words that are coming out of their mouth and what they're actually feeling towards you. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's kind of like the canary in the coal mine for all of this, right? If you if there's just something that you don't understand, that's a byproduct of omission on their side or a lack yep. of uh, some sort of disjointedness within the conversation, and then that can be counteracted yep. by you asking. And then if the follow up, it's like the the uh, little hurdle that you're asking them to step over, and if they can't get over that hurdle, it's right. probably because they 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 don't want to, I suppose. Right. You stated it perfectly. Absolutely. So I just don't engage with because, again, in that situation, I, I take people very specific. You know, it doesn't mean I can't trust them in another situation. But in this specific situation, the, the things that we're talking about, no, we're not going to have a healthy engagement here. So I, I'll, I'll just disengage. It sounds an awful lot like um, being quite frank and quite upfront, like almost not blasé, in, but certainly um, – certainly very upfront and, and and as transparent as you can be both in terms of what you are trying to uh, what you're trying to convey and what you do and don't understand is forming a, a quite a big basis here and i suppose that the foundation for a, a relationship of trust is truth uh, in two directions right and openness yeah you know and because you said you know very frank and, and and it is it can be very frank but at the same time though it's very uh, extremely cordial because it's always about them. You know, there's never me and it's never me inflicting my thoughts and opinions on you about you. I don't judge you. I don't say, Hey, I'm just being honest. Here's what you're an ass. You know, that's, that's, that's not the thing you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's about being, being frank and open about what my intentions are and trying to understand yours. Um, I, Cause that's, that's it. Yeah, I get that. So I wanted to uh, pick your brains as far as the, uh, uh, classified uh, <laughs> broadcaster will allow us um, to just get some some stories from your time while you're in the service. And the first thing that's come to mind for me is who do you think on the planet has the best uh, behavioral uh, agents? Would you say that the the US is really good, or the, do the Russians happen to be fantastic at it? Boy, everyone's you know it, I wouldn't put it down. With service, because services um, have, and services across all countries have have greatness and have and have inside each of those services that has the patience and, and the focus of trust on and put the and put the broader need of the country ahead of their personal need for self gratification and glory. Um, and I've seen that in every service um, I, I've worked with. I've seen some fantastic Russian officers. I've seen some hard Russian officers. I've seen some fantastic American CIA and FBI agents and some horrible ones. Um, and it, age doesn't matter. It, it comes down to does this person put in the mission of the country ahead of themselves? And do they have the patience to develop healthy, trusting relationships? The people that can do that, I don't care where you're from. Those are the ones that win. Because yeah. they're winning for a greater cause. That's it. it uh, I've seen it everywhere. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, so, how about when? Hold on, hold on. I'll give you one group that I'm most I was really, really impressed with. Okay. Um, they were uh, the United States um, Army Green Berets. I worked with them a couple years back, and the most different thing about them is that they were very much like uh, my career. My career was what it was, not because of any anything except oper just chance. It really was chance. I, was, I worked operations for 21 years. I did the same type of operations for 21 years. You're going to either get good or get out. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, and a lot of times in all these other organizations, you'll do it for a couple of years on a street, then you promote into management and up and up and up. And so you you're no longer doing the actual craft on the ground and you and you're going to lose it because one, you never mastered it to begin with, and two, you don't do it anymore. Mm. I, I was very fortunate that I, I did it for a number of years, then I was on the team and ran the team for a couple of years, still doing it. Um, and then I went back and did it for five more years before I retired. I mean, it was nonstop, constantly strategizing and strategizing, learning about what. And that's why I'm so altruistic about this, because ultimately it came down to people just want healthy relationships so they can survive. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I foster that? And so and I, when I mentioned the Green Berets, um, they spend this one particular group spent their entire career doing exactly the same thing. 
that's that's you're going to get mad skills at anything you do if you do it for that long. Yeah, it's just it, it's just so so services that allow their people to continually hone, practice, refine, and get best at their craft over years, they're going to be the best. You end up with some some real beasts at the end of that, I suppose. Yeah, you really do. And, and the greatest thing is the as you call them the real beasts. These are the ones that are actually the genuinely good people in life because they know the cause and effect of behaviors. They know that it all comes down to relationships and trust. And there's no, these are the ones that aren't playing games with people anymore. I like, I, I know people every now and then will say, Hey, when we're going out to dinner, why don't you, you know, talk to that waitress and get her date of birth and her pin number. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like, I, it's like, dude, do you understand? I don't, I don't play with people. I, I just refuse to play with people. I, I, I honor people too much and I, and I honor relationships and, and health and, and being a good human being too much to play with people. Um, are there some are there some agents that you've met who are sufficiently talented to be able to like if if they decided to put their foot to the floor so to speak would be able to um be able to do some things like that and really uh kind of use use these to get some surprising results out of people? Oh god yeah. I mean I so I got a friend of mine Chris Hagnagy, social engineer and actually I'm a board member on the Innocent Lies Foundation with him. He uses all his uh, technical uh, and cyber skills to protect companies, and then we took it to the next level, and we're protecting human trafficking with children around the world. And um, years ago, we put together a, a social engineering course where he certified people as social engineers. In other words, can these people go in and, and hack information from human beings and get these these the type of information that can compromise con- companies so that we can educate that company on protecting themselves against morons like us? You know, that are that are actually have nefarious uh, things in their minds because yeah if if yeah these these skills used by the bad guys that's why that's why there are hackers that's why there are you know data mines that get you know stolen all the time because it comes down to human beings and these techniques and the difference is is that those people are manipulating and have an agenda and generally agendas are on timelines and so that's why my with choice about maintaining contact or assistance is always one of my fail safes um, that makes sure this isn't manipulative. Also, no expectation or reciprocity. That's my also one. But these people, the bad guys, they're doing exactly the same thing. They just have an agenda. The good thing is, though, people with agendas tend to be much more impatient um, than people that are actually going for healthy relationships. So impatience, you can see through impatience very rapidly. That's so cool. I love the term social engineer as well. It, it really does sound like a hacker um, taken off the computer and into the real world. That's what they do. I mean, these guys are phenomenal. Chris and his team, you know, are phenomenal at this, and they have they, they have competitions, you know, and when they go to Black Hat every year, and it's just pretty fascinating. When we had classes out there, and he's, Chris about to have another class now down in Florida, you know, we send people, you know, teams out, you know, to. Uh, Engage people, elicit information, and practice how to do this. Again, no, no you know, no, no personal, you know, personal identifying information or anything to be compromised or anything like that. Just how do you practice engaging with a stranger and developing rapid trust? Yeah, I, I guess watching those guys at work must be pretty uh, fascinating and terrifying in equal measure. Yeah, it, it, it becomes, you know, when, you, when you're because then what's come down to? You're watching the elusive obvious. What are they doing? They're making it all about the other person. It's really pretty. It's really pretty simple if you know how to get out, out of yourself and out of your own ego. <laughs> yeah. So one th- one thing that keeps on coming to mind for me as well is obviously you will have been a a part of the agency through not quite through a digital revolution, but certainly through a, a digital surgeons, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. Did that and uh, has that made uh, a new body of information? Obviously, how much how much work is now done online and uh, and electronically versus face to face? That was huge. Um, you know, government organizations are generally light years behind everyone else, and ours was definitely one of them. Well, they're big, they're big and I, slow. They're hard, hard to get moving, right? Like you, you when you've got yeah. thousands and thousands of people that you need to drag along with you, it's going to take some time to get them up to speed. So we went over to uh, an, a paperless system, um, uh, 2011 to 2013 ish, um, maybe 2010 ish, um, and I thought this would never work. I mean, we were so entrenched with putting a hard piece of paper and into a supervisor's inbox to wait for a signature to get it back to put it in a file, which was nothing but a big fat thing of paper in a wall. And I said, "This is not going to work." And I'll tell you what. 
by the time, you know, within a couple of years, I mean, by the time I left, I, I, I'd never touched a piece of paper for years. Everything was electronic. Man, it sounds so fucking prehistoric. To hear, I know like, that you here's a thing that's going to happen, and there's a guy with a pen, and he's going to sign it. Like you probably couldn't even find a pen now. <laughs> uh, I always carry one. I, <laughs> just yeah. The, the other thing too was funny too. We moved on to believe it or not. When I first came in, we used to sign timesheets, and we used to have different colored pencils for the different kinds of hours we worked. And so we had to have the right colored pencil when we're filling our timesheet for the day. Oh, that's and that cute. got taken by our- That's quite cute, yeah. for, especially, especially for the FBI. I wouldn't have thought that they would have had something yeah. like that. Yeah, timesheets. Yeah, timesheets are big, and they finally got rid of that, and that went electronic too. Yeah, that was that was pretty funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. So yeah. uh, before we wrap up, Robin, I wondered if there were any uh, stories that you have that come to mind that you think might interest the listeners, anything that, that you've been thinking about recently or any situations with either friends or with past experiences for yourself. Huh. Yeah, I think the world's a pretty interesting place right now. That's That's, that's one thing. Moving forward, it, you, you th- what do you think the role of uh, intelligence officers will be as we as we go forward? It, it, oh, it's definitely continuing. Um, it has to be. You know, you know, you can only do so many things through a computer. Although using the same communication strategies through computers and emails, I do it all the time, and it's very effective. Um, the you, you're always going to need someone that's that tip of the spear, though. Do you think we're, we're never going to be able to just rely absolutely. on guys that are absolutely? Monsters well, how, behind well think about it. you know we have we have hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that let's say we develop trust in one way it's not going to get wiped out you know in a generation that went cyber mm. it's it, it's it, genetically you can't have it happen that, that's why you know when you think about facebook or twitter or, or instagram or any of these you know social media platforms people are looking for likes well why are they looking for likes they're looking for followers because that's validation so yeah. <laughs> My my anecdote is that it probably takes you about a thousand likes equal one person saying good job in live, um, in live presence. So again, these things are great. I got to tell you, they're fantastic tools, and I love them to death. Um, but still, one on one dialogue, communication, and trust, and and having a healthy relationship that way, um, because you're able to look at everything that's coming at you. You're able to hear the words, the visual cues, the non the nonverbal cues. All these things become very congruent with and my form in a healthy relationship is this is this genuine. And you can you can do an awful lot without that, um, but you're never gonna take it over an edge with, with it. Um, so that must be but, quite that must be quite reassuring, I suppose, to a degree that there's this kind of there's kind of like an upper ceiling. And uh, I remember uh, listening to uh, Sam Harris talk about the impact, the upcoming impact that virtual reality will have, and he talked about this. Uh, kind of cognitive ceiling, you could you could argue, as you've kind of alluded to there, where there's only so far in terms of persuasion that a flat screen in, in your hand or in front of you on a computer will be able to take you. However, the more immersive you make that experience, the higher that ceiling is going to become raised. So with things like VR and now these, <clears throat> these new um, programs where they can take like five minutes of you or me speaking and then completely recreate whatever they want with the words and the, and the phrases and the cadence that we've been speaking in. Um, that's, that's a, a pretty scary thought. It is. I, you know, I, I'm not one of these guys that says, Oh, it's always better the back this way, or it was much, you know, the good old days kind of guys. I, I, I love, I love watching the advances of things, but every time you have a new breakthrough in something, um, it confuses things. Society will be confused because of our coding, our genetic and biological coding. They'll they'll jump to it. Um, they'll they'll seeking immediate gratification, you know, intellectually from it in some way whatsoever, and then and then the brain's going to get confused for a while until they figure out how to actually make it a functional tool that actually aids life. Because it takes a while. Every time, every time there's a new jump forward in anything, there's always a, a stumbling period with trying to figure out how how does this actually interact with with this miraculous thing between our two ears that is uh, is really the most advanced advanced thing we'll ever see in our lifetime. Is this brain? It's it's pretty remarkable. It's crazy, isn't it? And I guess the pace of change as well. The fact is that society is able to move so much more quickly than our brains are. And the most stupid thing is that even if our brains were able to catch up. Even if you gave it like a decade to catch up, it'd still be so far behind. It would be almost pointless. 
You're like, I, I, I don't need you. Like 10 years ago, I didn't need my brain to be able to use a Filofax. I needed it to be able to use a BlackBerry. And right. it's, in 10 years' time, I won't need it to use Instagram. I'll need it to use whatever whatever's coming next in a decade. I still can't understand how I could get anything done 20 years ago. You know, with nothing but a pad of paper and, and, a, and a paper calendar on my desk. I have no idea how I live without that. A Google Calendar or scheduling or or constant communication with the world. I have no idea how I got anything done before. And then then you bring it up to now. I have no idea how I get so much done now because how do I because I, I could never I could not have possibly done all this kind of stuff twenty years ago. You know what the hell did I do with all my time? <laughs> it was, it, it's really it's fa- it's fascinating to think about. It must feel like or it must have felt like um looking back on your career now and like I say having seen the uh, both sides of this kind of digital surgeons to a degree. It it must almost feel like two different jobs. It's interesting. Uh, it does, and, and, and I'll give you an analogy. It's it, it's like a it's like a sense, you know, like one of our five senses. I remember I did a trip, and I won't say what country I went to because um, I don't want to disparage anyone. Yep. But we did this overseas trip, and you know, we went into their command center where they have all their analysts sitting inside this command center, and they had so much te- technological capabilities. Um, with, with following people in their own country, like the spies in their own country, that mm-hmm. they, I, I remember one of them uh, said that, yeah, it was a bad day if we only had 95% of this person's day covered or we knew what they were doing. 95, they knew what this guy was doing 95% of the time because of their technological coverage. Wow. And they asked, and they asked us, and I was like, and I was like, maybe 10% of the day we know what they're doing. And, but you know what their challenge was? They couldn't recruit sources. They had a very, very hard time using interpersonal skills to actually get human bodies recruited. And so they were massively behind in a lot of areas because one of their senses was enhanced, the technological sense, but their other sense of interpersonal skills was completely thrown out because they relied too heavily on the other. There was a com- so, compensatory uh, mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Right. And us, we, our, our, our interpersonal skills tend to be higher because our constitution – it keeps us from doing anything like that. Well, when you're skinned, <laughs> it, when you're skinned, you need to rely on your skills, don't you? You can't be, you can't be spending absolutely. loads of money on things. Um, an interesting statistic. I was watching a, a Amazon documentary recently, and they said that if you took the data that was collected on everybody on the Earth and you printed it on um, an A4 piece of paper, double-sided A4 piece of paper, every day's worth of data that gets collected would go from here to the sun and back four times. So the stack of paper mm. of data that is collected on a daily basis, and most of it's just garbage, gobbledygook to do with like location data and how many bytes of this and, and what address was it sent to, so on and so forth. But that's the volume of data that's to the sun and back four times. I just thought Crazy, that was, I thought I thought that was unbelievable yeah and the the another statistic that they dropped was that the the maddest thing to do with how efficient it is and you were talking earlier on about having the paper going in and out and all this sort of stuff if you were to remove all of the hardware and just have the electrons so the the actual uh atoms that are containing the information that the uh internet and all of all of the collective uh human knowledge electronically is held on it would be about the size and the weight of an orange so you think <laughs> you've got everything everything and all of the banks and banks of computers and the servers at google and all of this sort of, even the hard drive in your house and it's like just an orange that's all you've got yep and humbling can, isn't it yeah it really and then you compare that with to the sun and back four times a day <laughs> And um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's probably a, a pretty big credit to yourself and also the guys that you worked with that you were able to survive and adapt through that particular period because it, it must have been super turbulent. Um, yeah, you know, it's like anything, you either get on board or you get out. And it really, <laughs> I, I really kept it, I really try to keep things as basic as possible. And they did, it was every day there was always, they're always, man, I'm so sick of that systems getting updated. And it usually, you know, I've got a credo in life. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, they hell it. Nothing was broken. They fixed it every day anyway. It drove me up a wall. Yeah, yeah, I bet <laughs> it was. So, Robin, can you tell the listeners about your books, please, and where they can find you online? Yeah, sure. Um, so, 
first, let's do find me online. That's easy. My website is www.peopleformula.com. All one word, people formula. I'm on LinkedIn, obviously. Twitter is at rdreek, R-D-R-E-K-E. Follow me there. I don't post a whole lot and I don't take, here's the other thing too. I never take sides. I just take science <laughs> and, and, uh, human, and human interactions because here's another guarantee in life. Take a side, half the world will line up against you. Um, I don't like that. Um, and then, so my books, I, I have one, my first book came out years ago called It's Not All About Me, The Top 10 Techniques for Quick Rapport and Get On, on Amazon in Any Country. Um, that's a short read, about 20,000 words. Um, my last book that came out is called Code of Trust, an American Counterintelligence Expert's Five Steps to Lead and Succeed. Uh, that's also all over the place. That was with St. Martin's Press, great publisher I worked with there. And then my next book coming out, actually, um, it's, it's on behavioral analysis. And it's it's the six signs that you can actually judge whether you can trust someone or not. Actually, and more likely, it's predict their behavior. And we're still working on the title right now. Uh, it was uh, what's what, what's our current working title? Um, ah, just slipped my mind. We've had about three or four. I love it's, work, it's I love about- working titles. I love the the, <laughs> the journey that things go through. Like when we were coming up with the with the title for this podcast and I went through like this six month period while I was re- like pre-recording shows and doing things. And when I look back, I-, I went back through my notes not so long ago and I'm going through and I was thinking, what the fuck were you thinking? Like just looking at all of these crazy <laughs> names and it's because after a while, it's kind of like the name of a pet, right? Like the book, right. your, your book names will roll off your tongue as, as if it was, as if it was a, a child's name, but, during the process, you look at the words with such like high fidelity. You're like, is that even a word anymore? Does it, it doesn't sound like a word. It doesn't look like a word. <laughs> Actually, I just remembered it. It's called sizing people up is what it's called right now. It probably will be too. It's probably what's going to wind up being sizing people up. Nice. Um, well, if it changes, and, and it, we'll know, we'll know that you've had a, uh, <laughs> you've had a creative wobble. Another a creative wobble. That's a good description of it too. I have creative wobbles every day. <laughs> yeah, back and forth. Well, Robin, man, it's been absolutely fas- fascinating. I- I'd love to get you back on again soon. As I'm sure that the listeners oh, will be will be very interested to uh, to see what comes out with the next book. And uh, good luck finishing it off. Hey, thanks for that. Appreciate it, Chris, and thanks for all your time. Awesome. Thanks, man.